Hello, uh, friends of Apache, uh, our Apache community, our national member societies. Warm greetings from Apache. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this very nice web lecture series and panel discussion on a very important topic, a topic dermatitis, which is really prevalent in our region and the incidence of which is increasing uh, in recent years, especially in children. I have three excellent speakers from our region, from Malaysia, from Taiwan, and from Vietnam, who will talk about three different perspectives of atopic dermatitis. So I'd first like to call upon our first speaker, Professor Kent Wu, who is the president-elect of the Malaysian Society of Allergy and Immunology, a member society of Apache, and a very, very active member society of Apache, as well as of the World Allergy Organization also. Uh, Professor Kent is a consultant in pediatrics as well as in, in allergy and immunology and um, internal medicine at the Glen Eagles Hospital in Malaysia. He was also the scientific chair for the 2016 Apache Congress held in Malaysia, which was a great success. He's currently also the president-elect of the Malaysian Society of Allergy and Immunology. It's my great pleasure to welcome him to talk upon the current concepts of atopic dermatitis and its relation to food allergy. So Professor Kent, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ruby, for the kind introduction. It's indeed a great honor for me to be invited to give my talk. And I'm going to talk about atopic dermatitis and its relationship to food allergy. So there are three objectives on my presentation today. I'm first going to talk about how atopic dermatitis can lead to the development of food allergy. Then I'm going to demonstrate how food allergy can actually trigger the atopic dermatitis to flare. And finally, a brief discussion about food serum specific IgE sensitization versus allergy. So we know that in children with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, approximately one third will have food allergy. And the more severe the atopic dermatitis is correlated with increased risk of food allergy. Now, these are our big eight food allergens that we see in children. And over here on this corner are the foods that the food allergy that often resolve in childhood. And over here on this corner are food allergy that more likely to persist throughout the lifetime. Now, these three food allergens, which are cow milk, egg, and peanut, are the foods that are most likely to produce a positive oral food challenge in these children with atopic dermatitis. Now, I'm gonna start off by saying that skin barrier dysfunction can lead to food allergy. And this is one of the most interesting paper that was published in Jackie in 2016 where they measured transepidermal water loss, which is a marker for skin barrier dysfunction. And they measured it in the early newborn period, two days of life, and at the second and sixth month of age. And at two years old, these children then had food sensitivity and food allergy screening through skin prick tests and food challenges. A total of 1,260 underwent food sensitivity screening. And this was what the results show. Like I mentioned before, the three most common food allergens were egg, peanut, and milk that demonstrated a positive oral food challenge. Less were the following below over here. 
But what is the most important part of this study was what they found was the transepidelial water loss at the second day of life was a significant predictor of food allergy at two years old. You can see here about 74.5% of them at the highest quartile of water loss, they had the development of food allergy. Furthermore, they looked at children that had diagnosis of food allergy at two years old without the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis at two years old. And they found that at two days of life, their transepidermal water loss was a prediction for the development of food allergy, even in these children without the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. Where at the highest fourth quartile, about 60% of them had the development of food allergy. So the conclusion of this study was that neonatal skin barrier dysfunction can predict food allergy at two years of age, supporting the concept of transcutaneous allergen sensitization, even in infants who do not have atopic dermatitis. So how does atopic dermatitis, which is a skin problem, lead to the development of food allergy? This was a very interesting study that was published in 2003. And what they did was they took the BLB seam shave mice and they did epicutaneous sensitization through OVA and also intraperitoneal OVA sensitization as a positive control. What they found was that through the uh, epicutaneous sensitization, you can develop IgE sensitization. And this is the negative and positive control. Here is saline and this is the intraperitoneal OVA. These sensitized mice were then fed OVA and they developed anaphylactic responses after over challenge, demonstrating that you can develop food allergy through epicutaneous route. So what data has shown us now is that the skin is not an inert organ, it's actually an active immune organ. And they have these cells called dendritic cells that functions as a immune surveillance. And when you have barrier dysfunction, they can sensitize the immune system through the uptake of these allergens through these dendritic cells. So one of the key things that we should be aware of are food allergens that are found in creams. We've seen numerous studies that have shown that food allergens can sensitize through the skin to cause the development of food allergy. Over here is the New England Journal of Medicine on uh, peanut oil. This is published in Allergy in 2007 uh, by uh, Oat in uh, Oat uh, Cosmetic uh, found in protein, found in cosmetic uh, topical creams. And this is the most recent one that occurred in Japan. And this is the Ocha face soap which is a green uh, tea uh, soap. But what they did was they put hydrolyzed wheat protein in this soap. And then previous uh, people that had no wheat allergy developed a wheat anaphylaxis. This is a picture of a patient that developed tongue angioedema after consuming wheat, after using this face soap. So, then we move on to the question about children. Why do we have children who develop peanut allergy despite never eating peanuts and they're not using skincare products containing peanut protein? This is a study that was done by Gideon Lang's group, started in 2009, published in Jackie. What they found was that in these patients, these children that had peanut allergy, they actually had higher environmental exposure to peanut protein through the consumption of peanut in the household. They then went on to publish another paper as a follow-up in 2013 in Jackie, showing that this peanut dust that were found in these children with peanut allergy were actually biologically active and they can activate basophils. You can see you're increasing peanut protein causing increased basophil activation.
as compared to the non-allergic subjects. And this peanut dust is derived from environmental exposure through household peanut consumption. Then the last paper of the series was published in Jackie in 2014, where they demonstrated in these children with filaggrin loss of function mutation, increasing peanut protein in house dust was correlated with increasing probability of peanut allergy. You can see here a, a, a curve rising to the right as a, compared to the normal filaggrin uh, patients. So this supported that the hypothesis that peanut allergy can develop through transcutaneous sensitization in children with impaired skin barrier, which then led to the dual allergen exposure where through the skin, through inflamed skin, you can develop the food allergic sensitization and the development of food allergy. Through oral exposure is where you develop the immune tolerance. Now, since then, there have been many studies that looked at the skin barrier protection may prevent atopic dermatitis development. But this will be addressed by my other esteemed speaker, Professor Fang. I want to share with you a little bit of uh, intestinal permeability and atopic dermatitis. Uh, small studies, but very interesting. This was done initially in 1986 where the David Atherton group measured the urinary excretion of sugars and measuring the ratio of mannitol or rhamnose to lactulose, the large sugar, small sugar ratio can demonstrate gastrointestinal permeability. And in this study, they found that eczema subjects had increased intestinal permeability compared to controls. They then followed it up and this showed that they hypothesized that this might reflect mucosal damage by local heavy sensitivity reaction to foods. Then the same group followed this up with a publication in 1993. Again, very small numbers. It had 18 healthy children and 15 children in eczema. And this study showed that elimination diet improved eczema in nine of the 15 children. And three of the nine eczema improved children showed huge improvement in the intestinal permeability, which then lead to this complex interplay between eczema flare causing increased gastrointestinal permeability, which then leads to increased food allergy. On top of it, eczema can lead to food allergen sensitization with the development of food allergy, which then increases gastrointestinal permeability. So a complex interplay. I want to share with you a more recent uh, study that was published in uh, 2019 in the journal Immunity, where they look at the mouse model and they did the mechanical skin injury onto the skin in this uh, mouse that had a sensitization and food allergy, where they found that tape stripping caused increased uh, expansion of the intestinal mast cells, increased intestinal permeability, and promoted food anaphylaxis in these sensitized mice. So this further lends to the information that we had earlier that the skin and the gut and the immune system all communicates as a whole. Now the first, first role of food allergy in atopic dermatitis was demonstrated more than 100 years ago by Dr. Schlosch and has been demonstrated many times by many other studies. But this is where it gets confusing. Our patients seem to think that food allergy is the cause of atopic dermatitis, but it's not. It's actually that atopic dermatitis is associated with food allergy and there are many factors associated with atopic dermatitis. But if you are allergic to the food and you eat that trigger food, it can cause atopic dermatitis to flare. So this is a nice study that was published in Clinical Experimental Allergy, where they did oral food challenges in children with atopic dermatitis. And they found that 50% of all positive oral food challenges were associated with eczema exacerbation. And in 12% of them, they only had eczema reaction and no other 
immediate reactions. Now, these children with atopic dermatitis have specific T cells that home to the skin. And these T cells can recognize unique food allergens. And when you consume that food allergen, the T cells will activate and zone into the skin and cause allergic inflammation. And we see eczema flare. This is a nice study that was done in Journal of Clinical Investigation in 1995. And they looked at children with uh, atopic dermatitis with cow milk allergy. And when they challenged these children, the T cells express the CLA, cutaneous lymphocyte antigen, that allows the T cells to home into the skin. You can see increased expression of this uh, receptor compared to the controls. But this is what we see in signs where the skin express CLA home into the skin, the epidermal area, and they express the fast ligand, which causes cellular destruction. And you can see the rough scaly skin eczema flare. But this is what we see clinically, a child with cow milk allergy and eczema that has avoided cow milk and you see very nice clear skin on the face. And this has happened, this is an eczema flare that occurs after food challenge, can happen as quickly as a few hours or can be delayed up to 48 hours. So the question is, yes, food can trigger atopic dermatitis, but if you avoid the trigger food, can it improve the atopic dermatitis? And this is an old study that was done in Lancet in 1978 in trained children, where in these children that had eczema that were placed on an antigen avoidance diet to what they were sensitized to, they can see the negative uh, slope. You can see on a controlled diet, not much change. On the antigen avoidance diet, they showed improvement of their eczema. There's another small study in 55 children with atopic dermatitis and egg allergy. You can see the one with the dietary intervention, decreased eczema percentage area involved, severity scores improved. So I'm now going to go towards the last part of the, the talk, which is sensitization versus clinical allergy. We know that if you test positive to the foods, it does not necessarily mean clinical reactivity. In all these studies in which the child was proven to have uh, the food sensitization and atopic dermatitis flare, it was demonstrated through food challenges. So patients with atopic dermatitis can produce high levels of IgE antibody. And if you do panel testing and blood tests, it will test positive to many foods but many which will be tolerated if you actually do a food challenge. And this is what happens with inappropriate testing. I have food allergies, don't feed me. That's why we don't recommend broad-based screening and testing. And this is what happened. You can see malnutrition in this child with wrongly diagnosed food allergy and food avoidance. And upon uh, proper intervention, you can see a much better, healthier uh, outcome. So it's very important to not just simply eliminate test positive foods because a lot of people will say, well, what's the harm? It's positive, we just avoid it, everything gets better. But here's the thing, studies are now showing, and these are two studies that have shown that if you were previously tolerating the food and you tested positive, but you were tolerating it perfectly fine and you eliminate that, food from the diet. It can trigger a type 1 IgE mediated food reaction when that food is reintroduced later on. And some of these studies, the elimination diet was as short as two weeks. And one upon reintroduction after that period of time, they actually developed a type 1 IgE mediated food reaction. So, we have to be very cautious. We cannot simply test. We must test specifically, and we must always follow that with a oral food challenge, which is the best way to determine if it was just a food sensitization versus a true allergy. However, this must be done carefully uh, under a monitored setting because we can have severe reactions in this situation. 
So in conclusion to my talk, I want to share a few points. First is that food allergy can develop from skin sensitization. And atopic dermatitis with food allergy will have eczema flare upon ingestion of the trigger food. And if you eliminate that trigger food, atopic dermatitis will improve. Now these atopic dermatitis patients can have very elevated IgE levels that can cause false positives in food allergy testing. So therefore you must do focus testing and you must do oral food challenge to confirm true allergy. And we now have to be aware that strict elimination diets for children with atopic dermatitis should be avoided as it can actually lead to loss of tolerance and when you introduce this in a later date, it can lead to an IgE-mediated reaction. Well, that concludes my talk, and I will uh, be happy to take the Q&A at a later stage after my esteemed colleagues have completed their presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Ken Fu. That was a brilliant lecture and very, very practical and useful. And we look forward to the discussion in the um, end of all the three lectures. It's my great pleasure to now introduce uh, the next speaker is Professor Jiao Yao Wang. Professor Jiao Wang is the distinguished uh, professor of pediatrics and director of the Center for Allergy and Immunology at the National Cheng Kung University in Tainan in Taiwan. Professor Wang is well published and he is uh, the past president of the Taiwan Academy of Allergy and Asthma and Clinical Immunology. And of course, he's the president elect of Apache. And uh, we have been working very closely together um, for several years. It's my pleasure to welcome him to talk about a very important topic that is uh, uh, the future of uh, maybe one of the preventative strategies, and that will be on the role of probiotics uh, in atopic uh, dermatitis. So, Professor Wang, please. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your attendance for our party uh, uh, webinar. I think this topic is very important, and I would thank uh, Professor Dupi Pawanka to introduce me. Um, I was going to present uh, our uh, research work on the probiotic and uh, what is the role uh, in the um, prevention and uh, maybe uh, on the therapeutic potential to treat atopic dermatitis. I'm going to present uh, on the three points. One is uh, to introduce what is the microbiome in our skin that may be related to the development for atopic dermatitis. And secondly, I will introduce some of the clinical study on the property. And thirdly, I will introduce some of our research on the effect on property on the treatment for the allergy disease. So you can see from this slide, uh, the allergy disease that um, have a very uh, complex interaction for our genetic factor as well as the environment factor. So if we got a susceptibility gene of attitude and still we have um, uh, some of the heritage factors that will become uh, more, in, uh, more exposure uh, to the environmental uh, stimulant, then we will easily become allergy disorder. But most importantly is the uh, genetic by the uh, environmental factor, these two interaction that will cause our immune system to somehow deviate to the type two inflammation response. And I would like to focus on the uh, a separate point is that our allergy disorder is truly, is a systemic uh, type two uh, immune response uh, uh, reaction. And then most importantly, they have a share some of the uh, common uh, pathology uh, disorder. So you can see that from this slide, for the allergen related, you can see the mucosa membrane have uh, inflammation, have a lot of eosinophil infiltration in the respiratory absence cell. Uh, 
And uh, also, if you go down to the, to see the food allergy, and the food allergy, they have also inflammation in the food, uh, in the now intestinal epithelial cell, and so called maybe uh, cause the uh, gut leakage syndrome. So our previous uh, lecturer, uh, Professor uh, Ken Wu, have a uh, nice data show that food allergy and and atopic dermatitis was related together, and it, it, it can also be shown that in the pathological part, the mucosal membrane and also skin barrier have been disrupted. So, and also allergy asthma, you, we all know that it's also a, a bronchial epithelial cell inflammation. So all these uh, allergy disorder have a common feature is that they all have a mucosal inflammation there. And then and, and a lot of uh, uh, factors that cause the immune uh, mucosa inflammation may be due to the immune reaction that respond to our microbiota that uh, colonize in our mucosa membrane. But still, in in the in our healthy status, we can see that it have a lot of uh, different kind of uh, microbiome, uh, microbiota rested on our uh, mucosa membrane as well on the skin. So even in our skin, in the different part of, uh, of our body, in the tarsal part, or in the upper limb, or even in our uh, soft tissue, like uh, eye leaf, or even uh, in the other mucosa membrane, they have a different kind of uh, uh, pre uh, preference for different kind of microbiota. And all these microbiota, some part they can uh, um, have a exert a uh, immunological response that will somewhat uh, suppress for the inflammation. And if we lose this, uh, if we lost the so-called the healthy uh, microbiota there, some heart they will become a dysbiosis, and a lot of pathobiome they will become dominant, and then they may be cause the inflammation and also inflammatory disease coming out. So you can see uh, there have one of our hypotheses said uh, um, before our uh, full colonization for the healthy uh, microbiota, if we have some of the uh, stress, maybe due to the environment, due to our diet, or even uh, even give it the antibiotic, and they will have some for destroy uh, for our microbiome system. So this maybe have a long lasting effect. So according to this hypothesis, we have a collect uh, our uh, national health database, and we uh, we use uh, our newborn baby and the follow up for five years and ask uh, one single uh, simple question is that if this uh, newborn child, uh, newborn children have been uh, administered for the antibiotic. Uh, before one year old age, is it possible that will increase the risk for uh, for the allergy disorder such as like atopic dermatitis, allergy rhinitis, or asthma? So you can see from this study is that we collected a, a national health database on the 1998. At that time, they have a, a more than uh, uh, two uh, two hundred and sixty thousand uh, a newborn child, and then we follow up for five years. And the other first cohort is studied from 2003, but at that, uh, at that time, it's a small scale. And from this slide, you can see the incident for the atopic dermatitis for all this po uh, newborn uh, uh, population. You can see from uh, uh, the nine have shown that uh, dark line is the it, it's, it's a, uh, it, it's a subject group that never have been uh, exposure to the uh, to the antibiotic, so you can see the incident for the uh, AD will started decreasing after two years of age and uh, continue for five uh, five years of age, and if they have been exposure to the antibiotic, they will become a uh, green a uh, green dash nine, and then the incident uh, for this uh, risk for to develop atopic dermatitis will increase one uh, uh, one hundred percent or become um, a double. And and they also have um, when they using the acetaminophen, they also have the same effect. And for uh, they, they just not only on uh, one cohort for five years. You can see the second cohort started from two thousand and three. You can see the increased trend for atopic dermatitis after using uh, antibiotic before one years of age also increasing. 
And then for the other allergy disease like asthma, you can see that the, the asthma will, uh, have, will increase about 50% after exposure for the antibody become a uh, green dash 9 as compared to the uh, uh, dot, uh, uh, dot 9. And uh, if they have uh, also activate um, uh, uh, add-on uh, acetaminophen, they also increase for the instant um, uh, for the asthma, and the, the peak will become three years to four years of age. And the allergy rhinitis also have the same trend. So in so in all of this uh, follow up, uh, so uh, our national health database, we have found that if they have even exposure to the antibody, then a topic for the uh, for the health uh, for the risk loss will increase about five, um, uh, become uh, one point uh, sixty five. That will increase about sixty five percent. But if they also in um, exposure to the antibiotic, uh, the other acetaminophen, they will become a one hundred percent increases. So it's very important that we uh, study to think about the the uh, gum microbiome or uh, the the composure and also the healthy status for uh, for our uh, gut microbiota may be related to the allergy di uh, disorder uh, di development. So it's a very important when we think about the skin barrier uh, it, uh, and also skin bone in our uh, 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 in, in our patient and uh, for atopic dermatitis because it's already have been shown that. Uh, uh, the skin, skin barrier um, uh, to keep the water or the so-called transepidermal water loss will increase and it become a dry skin for a lot of a uh, dermatitis uh, patient. And then this uh, skin barrier also uh, increase uh, uh, composed of the uh, to to prevent uh, microbiota to get inside and also keep the water. But the other part is somehow they have can uh, produce uh, a lot of antibacterial uh, 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 peptide. So if we, is one of the very, uh, very uh, recent studies have shown that the um, patient have suffered with AD have a different kind of composition for their skin biome. And you can see for the opportunist pathogen were uh, um, in the 80 patient were increased, such as the, you can see the streptococcus or gemena and the hemophilus. And then the other so-called healthy one, that is in some parts they have, can have an uh, anti uh, pathobiome uh, bacteria, uh, such as like uh, uh, the other uh, thermococcus or the other dimethylcoccus and mesial uh, bacteria. These bacteria have uh, lost them uh, and as compared to the normal uh, uh, normal people, the AD patient have a fewer uh, for this uh, metabolic and versatile bacteria. So it's very interesting to find out is that is uh, what happened in the gut and in the, our intestine. They have a dysbiosis. Some of this uh, this dysbiosis microbiota can produce some of the uh, metabolic that will uh, will cause the itching for the for the skin. And then some of the metabolic have a uh, harmful effect, uh, and then maybe lead uh, to the T cell become activate. Like uh, Professor Ken Wu have just mentioned that some of the activate uh, T cell were migrated from the intestine and to the to the skin that cause the inflammation in the skin epithelial cell. So it's so you can see that uh, for for a lot of atopic dermatitis patient. Their skin they have a, a different kind of, of bacteria and uh, microbiota uh, composition, and the most important, they will become a pathogenic. Line. And a lot of staphylococcus aureus they can produce a lot of metabolite, and also they have a so-called super uh, super antigen effect that will uh, induce immune immunological inflammation. So it's it's very interesting that it's um, the atopic dermatitis is somewhat different from the uh, microbiota uh, composition as compared to normal one. But the question is that if we will change the microbiota, it's impossible we can decrease the symptom of the disease for atopic dermatitis. So one of the 
uh, uh, one of the possibility I also call it intervention is that using the so-called probiotic. And the probiotic effect is for um, for uh, for the our GI uh, health is really uh, well documented. So you can see that if we have a probiotic that is the, uh, like a lactobacillus or or the bifidus strain, they can somehow uh, to uh, have a resistance to the E. coli or the other uh, so-called pathogenic uh, bacteria to colonize in our intestinal gut. And then some quite, uh, the lactobacillus uh, like, uh, belong to the property have uh, induced for regular T cell. And this cell maybe have an inflammation response. So one of the very important seminar paper published in Lancet in the 2001 they have been using the uh, one or hypothesis that to to show that maybe uh, administration per probiotic before uh, in the per perinatal period maybe have they can prevent uh, for allergy disorder uh, to develop. So you can see from this slide is that they uh, administrate for the lactobacillus uh, remnants. This is called the LGG uh, in the uh, mother to be during the uh, the 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 last uh, trimester. And continually for after the baby have a born and until one years of age, and they have clearly show that the the prevalence for atopic dermatitis uh, in the administration for probiotic group have decreased about fifty percent, and in this effect will uh, lasting for for three years, and at that time, so uh, so it's a uh, really quite interesting that. A lot of properties can they can have uh, this kind of uh, a clinical uh, effect. Even our uh, even in the uh, WAO uh, World Organization in the uh, gut uh, gut P uh, paper have also all suggested that in the high risk uh, pregnancy mother they, they maybe have an allergy uh, high risk uh, incident. Maybe they can use the property uh, during the prenatal area uh, periods. And let's continue for the uh, newborn, peri uh, newborn, peop uh, newborn uh, period. They can have the medical incident uh, to decrease for the atopic dermatitis. So in the last part, I will introduce some of the our clinical trial that will maybe have some of the effect uh, using the probiotic. So I was uh, we were select uh, one of the doctor that we call the guessery because in our laboratory we have shown that if we administrate for the L. Uh, and uh, that the gastery that will uh, increase for our 10 in the dendritic cell and uh, and also in the animal study we found they can decrease for the allergy disorder come out such as in the allergy asthma so we were decided is any possible we can use the double blind and clinical trial and then this is the randomized possible clinical trial uh, a mystery for the data person gastery for three months and uh, you can uh, uh, sorry for two months mm -hmm. and uh, we measure and uh, for the uh, asthma symptoms, so you can see the probiotic group somewhat they can decrease for the nighttime asthma symptom, and also um, also for the other mucosa allergy symptoms like eye symptom, and also the allergy rhinitis and in the probiotic group they will uh, uh, significant uh, uh, decrease uh, for the allergy and rhinitis symptom after uh, two months of treatment, and then. And especially, we found it very interesting for uh, for the aging system uh, in, in this uh, in, in this subject. Uh, they were uh, uh, dramatic improving and it decreased for the allergy symptom. So, in the follow up study, we were uh, we were uh, recruit uh, two hundred forty uh, atopic dermatitis patient, and we use um, uh, we have a four arm and a treat to treat a different kind of uh, a combination for the uh, lactobacillus. One is using the lactobacillus uh, palacasia, the other uh, using lactobacillus ferm fermentum. And in the third group, we have using the combination. And you can see that all these three groups with the property have a significant decrease for the score rate uh, uh, score in, in the treatment group and as compared to the placebo group. And this effect was particularly on the uh, three months of, uh, uh, of treatment, there was a significant difference between the score rate and score. And, and very interesting is that we found the total IG is somewhat lower, but not, uh, not uh, to the significant level of decreasing. But it's very interesting. We're using the 
And because all these atopic dermatitis were sensitized to the hot house mine, and then we use the skin reactivity uh, against using the prick test uh, to check the sensitivity to hot house mine. After three months of treatment, all the probiotic group have decreased for the sensitization. So we were thinking that it's not just only uh, use uh, as compared to uh, the 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 beneficial effect is not just only you as uh, a decrease for the total IgE, it may be due to the increase for the regulatory T cell that were also uh, expressed in the skin reactivity. And then the other interesting uh, finding is that we were uh, provided for lack of strain for property, and then we collect the stool and to assay for the bifidus and uh, cross treating. And we we know the bifidus uh, um, a strain in the in our stool uh, stool will uh, and the gut microbiota will have a beneficial effect, and the constricting somehow will have a increase for the risk for atomic dermatitis. But after uh, Dr. Passer's treatment, we found that all three groups have increased for bifidus and decreased for the constricting uh, group. So definitely. The, for using the Dr. Press, some part different can change for uh, uh, composition for the microbiota. And uh, the other uh, interesting is that we have using the, just uh, Professor Ken Wu had mentioned, we have using a uh, mouse model that was sensitized uh, to induce for the atopic dermatitis that sensitized to the hot dust mine. So we have using this one and administrated for the, uh, 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 we have using uh, uh, over albumin and how does mine to in to uh, become a, a mouse model for uh, for atopic dermatitis that was sensitized to the whole BA and the therapy. You can see that the skin folding is increasing, scaling will also increase and compare as compared to the PBS and the trans epidermal water loss is, is increasing and the skin epidermal skin was also increasing and the eosinophil infiltration also uh, was increased as compared to the uh, controls mine. And when we use in the data price case, uh, case rate for the 10 to 7 doses of a uh, quantity of property, already they have can see, uh, you can see the skin have been uh, more smooth and uh, trans epidermal water loss also decreasing. And you can see the skin uh, above and the epidermal uh, skin for uh, skin sickness also decreasing. And then you can see some of the eosinophil field infiltration also decreases after uh, the mice have been given uh, for the data based uh, gas ray. And then the other such as like a, a nan green on the, the other TSLP also decreasing after probiotic treatment and also TSC 17 cell also decreasing. And the other uh, more interesting is that we found that data gas ray also contains some of the peptide we have isolated, we call the LGB40. And then this LGB40 peptide from um, probiotic also can decrease for uh, uh, non inflammation induced by the hot house mine. So we decided to use in the injection and then we found that it still have a, a same effect as compared using the, uh, uh, the whole, uh, whole uh, whole probiotic uh, bacteria, which are only using the peptide, it, the peptide also can have have this um, anti atopic dermatitis effect, and uh, you can see the, the inflammation uh, is also decreasing after using the pro, um, uh, using peptide uh, uh, that purified from the data bacteria. And a lot of atopic dermatitis they have also showed the apoptosis in their skin. And we found that this peptide can decrease for the early apoptosis after um, allergen challenge. So this is the effect. And uh, for the summary and the conclusion is that we found that a lot of atopic dermatitis uh, may be due to the skin barrier defect and also they were changing for the, their microbiota. And, and so this skin barrier uh, inflammation will increase for TSLP and a lot of um, uh, uh, muscle will, will be activation and the T cell will, will come out particularly on T17 cell. And if and if we uh, uh, use the letterpress gasoline uh, before the uh, sensitization, we found they can prevent uh, all this TSLP production and uh, decrease for the L17 and uh, increase for L10. And um, and the other study we have shown that in that type of gastro, they can increase for telogenic uh, dendritic cell, we call a CD103 um, uh, positive dendritic cell, that, that is the telogenic dendritic cell. 
And using the uh, LGP40, that is the peptide, also have the same effect that, that can treatment. So we found that there's a, a quite a potential to use the probiotic uh, to, to have a prevention. And maybe in the future, uh, maybe we can have a therapeutic effect for atopic dermatitis, right? So thank you for your attention. I'm uh, happy you want to answer any question after our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jia Wang. That was a brilliant lecture. It's a very, very important topic. You know, even uh, we developed the GLAD-P or the Global Guidelines uh, for the Prevention of Atopic Disease, looking at the different probiotics and prebiotics. So it's very, very important um, area to see um, whether we can prevent the development of these diseases and what are the factors and for that to also understand the microbiome in the skin as well as in the gut. So uh, it was a brilliant lecture. Thank you so much. And um, we'll have the discussion towards the end. So I'd like to now call upon um, our third speaker of this uh, session. Um, he is from Vietnam and uh, Professor Du is a lecturer at the Department of Immunology in the University of Medicine and Pharmacy uh, at Ho Chi Minh City. He is also the Scientific sec Secretary of the Vietnam Society of Allergy, Asthma and Clinical Immunology and has been an active uh, participant of Apache conferences, actively presenting papers, has received awards at our conference and is also uh, served as a junior member or steering committee member for the junior members in the World Allergy Organization as well as in Apache. And so we're honored to have him uh, speak at this uh, uh, panel discussion on topic dermatitis. And he will cover another very, very important topic because emollients are supposed to be a matter of uh, key discussion in actually trying to uh, protect the skin, pre prevent um, uh, worsening of atopic dermatitis, and also in that way may be related to food allergy. So uh, he will talk on skin moisturizing in atopic dermatitis and the concepts that need to be reviewed. So please, Professor. Uh, thank you, Professor Rivema Wanka, for your kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to join this webinar. And uh, it's also my honor to uh, discuss with you in this very interesting topic about atopic dermatitis. And uh, as uh, the previous presentation from uh, Professor uh, Ken Wu, we can see that in the atopic dermatitis patient, the skin is impaired. And therefore, in the guidelines for atopic dermatitis treatment, it's very common to see the recommendations on skin moisturizer used. And today I would like to discuss with you uh, those recommendations uh, to see whether those recommendations uh, are based on uh, strong evidence or they need to be uh, further reviewed by uh, other studies. And uh, my talk today uh, has four issues. First, I would like to give a brief introduction about evitable barrier and moisturizer. Next, I will summarize uh, the recommendation on using moisturizer uh, in AD treatment. And then I will present our study evaluating the effectiveness of early and delay moisturizing. And finally, I will discuss about the moisturizer, its roles in the skin pH and atopic dermatitis. So uh, first of all, I uh, would like to give you an overview about the epidermal barrier and moisturizer. As we all know that the epidermal layer function is a barrier protecting the underlying tissue uh, from desiccation, infection, irritation, and the penetration of the allergen. The water from the deeper layer moves upwards to the stratum corneum layer and hydrated it. And the stratum corneum layer uh, function as a barrier to prevent the loss of too much water from the skin due to the evaporation process. Therefore, if the stratum corneum layer is impaired, it leads to the increase in the loss of water the increase in the trans epidermal water loss, as well as the decrease in the skin hydration and the attack of external pathogens, such as, uh, for example, the microbes or uh, the chemicals or uh, the allergen. 
which is associated with a various kind of skin inflammation, including atopic dermatitis. The structures of the epidermal layer is described as a model of bricks and mortar that we already know. The bricks are the corneal side, and the lipid layers uh, are the inter intercorneal side layers that have to maintain the integrity of the epidermis. So based on this structure, uh, there are several kinds of moisturizer that have to uh, restore the impaired epidermal layer in AD with different mechanisms. Moisturizers are substances that have to uh, maintain the moistness in the skin and also have to restore the integrity of the skin of AD patient. Uh, there are uh, three types of moisturizer that, uh, that are usually used. First is the emollient. The emollient consists of the lipid that mimic the lipid layer of the epidermal layer. Uh, and it can fill the intercorneal side cluster gaps to maintain the integrity of the epidermis. Second is occlusive. Occlusive is, uh, is usually um, oil based and it will create a hydrophobic barrier over the skin and therefore blocking the evaporation to uh, restore uh, the skin level in the skin, uh, the, the water level of the skin. And uh, third is the humectant. Humectant is consists of the hygroscopic substances that uh, help the stratum corneum to absorb the water by attracting the water from deeper layer or from uh, the humid environment into the epidermis. So uh, the proper selection of the moisturizer will help to uh, restore the skin impairment in AD patients. This table summarizes the moisturizer and the mechanism of action of those moisturizers. We can see here the emollients consist of saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons, such as the fatty acid, fatty alcohol, cholesterol, or ceramide. And it is indicated to use in routine skin care or to apply onto dry and proof skin, especially in AD patients. And humectant consists of low molecular substances such as the urea, sorbitol, glycerol, and so on, and is the indicated in case of cirrhosis or ichthyosis. Occlusives consist of oil and waxes, such as the mineral oil, petroleum, uh, beeswax, or zinc oxide, and it is used to prevent the contact dermatitis, or it is indicated in case of cirrhosis or atopic dermatitis. And uh, to be not that uh, occlusive uh, is a oil base, therefore it can cause the folliculitis or contact dermatitis or even the eruption of acne if we apply onto the face. So what do guidelines recommend on moisturizer use? A guideline of the Eczema Society of Canada published in 2017 recommended to apply the moisturizer immediately after bathing or any water exposure to improve skin hydration. And in the book of clinical dermatology published in 2015, we also see that they recommend to apply the moisturizer within three minutes after bathing. And uh, very recently, um, uh, Chirpani Society of Allergy recommend to apply the moisturizer immediately after bathing. And they also suggest that the temperature of the water that used in bathing or showering for AT patients should be set about 38 to 40 Celsius degree because the optimal temperature for recovery skin barrier functions is about 36 to 42 Celsius degree. However, we tried to find the evidence that they cited, but there was no direct evidence or there was the evidence in animal model, but not in human to support to this recommendation. Um, another review in the round of moisturizer in dermatitis they also stated that um, the occlusive uh, oil should be applied on moistened skin by prior showering or bath. And they also said that after eight hours, only 50% moisturizer remained on the skin surface. Therefore, the patient should apply the moisturizer one to three times daily. And again, we could not find any direct evidence supporting uh, these statements. Uh, another review article uh, published on the expert opinion on pharmacotherapy, uh, we also found the same recommendation that 
um, the hydration state that is the best maintain when moisturizer and topical medication are applied immediately after bathing. And they cited one reference. And we look uh, for that reference, and that reference was a study uh, to compare the effect of different moisturizing regimen. The, red, uh, the, the moisturizing after bathing, immediately after bathing, or 30 minutes after bathing, or moisturizing without bathing. And uh, the study concluded that no statistical difference in mean hydration status between immediate and delayed moisturization regimen is by guidelines. So it means maybe the previous review um, misunderstand uh, the conclusion of this study or misunderstand the data of this study. Um, another guideline published in 2018 in Asia Pacific Allergy also recommend to apply the moisturizer immediately after parting and at least two or three times a day. And they also cited a reference. We look for that reference. And that reference was a, a, a survey on the knowledge, attitude, and practices of Southeast uh, Asian dermatologists. However, this study was not uh, they did not investigate the effect of early, immediate, or delayed moisturizing uh, regimen on education. But in the discussion part, they, uh, they stated that the application of topical steroid and moisturizer immediately after that is important in the management of AD. And they cited another reference. And we look for that reference. And that re reference was a study investigating the effect of shock on provoking skin in, uh, inflammation in AD. And on the study subject were applied moisturizer immediately after bathing. That means there was no compare grip with delayed moisturizing. So I think this study is not appropriate uh, reference for that recommendation. Um, the, Academy, the American Academy of Dermatology also recommended uh, to apply the moisturizer after bathing with a strand of recommendation is B level and the level of evidence is two. And they cited two reference. The first reference is the study that I have already presented concluded that there was no difference in uh, the effectiveness of moisturizing between immediate or delayed moisturizing. And the second uh, reference, uh, we look for that reference and we, we, we found that that reference also did not investigate the effect of the early or delayed moisturizing. But in the introduction part of that article, they stated that moisturizer should then be applied immediately after bathing before skin has completely dry. And they cited two references. The first references was the consensus conference. And we know that the consensus is not very strong evidence to support the recommendation. And the second, uh, rec the second reference was a review article, and we also look for that article. And that article also recommend to apply the, rec uh, the moisturizer within three minutes after bathing. And we found that the, the reference for that statement was not direct, but is direct. So generally speaking, we uh, see the recommendation of using moisturizer right after bathing everywhere in any guidelines, in any reviews of moisturizer use in AD treatment. However, no direct evidence and the evidence is very weak or even the wrong, the misunderstanding of the, the, the reference was used to support for that um, recommendation. Therefore, uh, our team uh, performed a study to evaluate the effectiveness of the immediate and delayed moisturizing. It is very initiative study. So we perform a study in healthy volunteers with no skin disease or no uh, chronic diseases. And the age of the study subject was from 18 to 25 years old. We had 30 males and 30 females. And on the study subject did not smoke, drink coffee or alcohol within 24 hours before enrollment. They did not wash, bath or uh, work uh, heavily or did not apply sun cream or moisturizer within three hours before enrollment. We measure the stratum corneum hydration or SCH and transepidermal water loss DWL by using a device named GP, GP Skin. Um, firstly, we measure the, SC, the baseline SCH and TWL level, and then 
uh, the, the, the study subject wash their uh, forearm. We apply the different regimens of moisturizing on their forearm. The left forearm were left uh, unmoistured, and um, the right in the right forearm, in the lower part, we apply the moisturizer immediately after washing. Uh, that means within three minutes after washing. And the upper part of the forearm, we apply the moisturizer 30 minutes after washing. That means we have B as uh, immediate moisturized skin and C as a delayed moisturized skin. We found that uh, in the non-moisturized skin, the SCH uh, spontaneously increased after 60 minutes. And uh, in the moisturized skin, the SCH significantly increased right after applying the moisturizer. When we compare the SCH level between moisturized skin and non-moisturized skin, we found that the moisturized skin immediate or delayed moisturized skin had significantly higher SCH level compared to non-moisturized skin. Regarding the trans epidermal water loss, we found that the non-moisturized skin spontaneously decreased the TEWL level time dependently, and the same finding was found with the moisturized skin. That means the moisturized skin had also decreased, time dependently decreased in TEWL. And um, we also found that the skin with moisturizing has significantly lower level of TEWL level compared with the non-moisturized skin. And then we uh, evaluate uh, the, the change in SCH, SCH and TEWL level with the baseline and compare between the immediate and delayed moisturized skin. And interestingly, we found that there was no significantly difference in the chance of SCH level as well as TEWL level between the immediate and delayed moisturized skin. That means if we apply the moisturizer uh, right after bathing or 30 minutes after bathing, there was no significant difference in uh, the restoring of the skin hydration. So we concluded that in how the healthy skin could have natural recovery functions and the second conclusion is that the immediate or delayed moisturizing after washing or bathing did not show different effects on epidermal barrier recovery. Uh, although uh, our study have some limitation, for example, the age, and we only did the uh, study on healthy skin, but our uh, findings suggested that we should consider again the recommendation uh, in the use of moisturizer for AD patient whether we should advise the patient to apply the moisturizer right immediately after bathing, is it have any meaning or not, should be uh, further investigated. And next, I would like to discuss about the role of moisturizer and skin pH. Before talking about the skin pH, I would like to remind about the filacrine in atopic dermatitis. As we all know that uh, in the skin of atopic dermatitis, with or without a uh, filacrine mutant, uh, the filacrine expression is decreased. And uh, we also know that the filacrine is very crucial in maintaining the epidermal barrier integrity. It helps to aggregate the keratin fibers to maintain uh, the structural integrity of stratum corneum layer. And uh, when the filacrine degraded, it will turn into several um, substances that help to maintain the skin acidic pH and especially it turned into PCA which is a natural moisturizer to help the skin hydrated. So the skin of the AD patient have a low level of filacrine therefore it can cause the increase in pH and decrease in the natural moisturizing factor and the increase in pH of the skin will lead to the barrier of perturbation, the outer microbiome and the cytokine release which caused the inflammation of the skin into the TH2 type. So we can see that the skin pH is very important in the pathogenesis of the AD. Several studies already investigated uh, the uh, if we maintain the acidic uh, environment of the skin of AD patient, we can get a better management of AD. But we should note that most of the moisturizer have the pH of acidic that means pH of 5.5. .5. But when we apply that moisturizer into our skin, the, uh, the pH of the skin doesn't change. It comes back to 
the high pH level is previous. So uh, we should select the moisturizer that have the buffering function. That means when we apply the moisturizer onto the skin, it helps to uh, uh, maintain the acidic environment of the skin. So in conclusion of my talk, I would like to um, mention about the moisturizer, which is very important in uh, AD treatment. However, the recommendation on appropriate time of applying moisturizer should be carefully investigated. And also we should uh, select the moisturizer with the pH buffering function that help to, uh, to get the better management for AD patient. And thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I also would like to say thank you to Professor Lady Pickland, who is a chairwoman of Ho Chi Minh Society, the Asthma, Allergy, and Clinical Immunology. Also, Dr. Trịnh Hoàng Kim Tú and uh, Nguyễn Hoàng Kim Hưng, who are uh, our team members in the research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ji. It was wonderful and a very, very important topic. Uh, that is very practical and essential in the everyday practice of our clinician, both for uh, adults with atopic dermatitis, but even more so in children, very young children who have uh, eczema at uh, the early stage of life, and, and especially in, co in the context of also its relation with food allergies. Also glad you covered the fact of filigrin, which is another important aspect of epithelial barrier. I think the three talks were excellent. And I would like to now invite uh, all the three for us to have a panel discussion. So uh, if I may start um, uh, with uh, asking the question, and then please, uh, I would like discussion amongst you all uh, so that uh, it's um, more interactive uh, and also we can uh, learn much ourselves as well as uh, our Apache community and membership can learn very much from this uh, panel or discussion. So, um, Professor Kent, I was uh, wanting to ask you, especially because this is the, in the recent years, as you covered in your talk, the um, importance of atopic dermatitis not just as a topic dermatitis itself but also its relation to food allergy has made it even more important to control it especially in early life and uh, in clinical practice we've seen also that controlling uh, the uh, skin uh, the topic eczema has also helped improve actually their food allergies so um, a couple of things i wanted to ask is one is uh, in your um, patients uh, with food allergies, the children have food allergies, say for to egg, and they have very bad atopic dermatitis or, or eczema, do you advise uh, that the mother should uh, exclude uh, egg in her diet um, mm. uh, in the full form or even egg as a, a composite of some other products? Do you advise that? Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. I think, uh, uh, you know, I think the guidelines are uh, rapidly changing. In the past, we used to say to prevent food allergy, you have to avoid the uh, culprit or trigger allergen and you don't introduce it until later in life. I think now the new guidelines after the, uh, the LEAP paper has shown that these children with uh, atopic dermatitis, if you introduce the allergenic food, so in LEAP it was a peanut, you introduce it early in uh, life, uh, around four to six months of age, not earlier, and you want to introduce it in small amounts, and they found that they developed uh, ability to develop tolerance to the peanut and to prevent a peanut allergy. So after that, many other papers are uh, encouraging the same uh, results. Of course, differing findings in different uh, papers. So in general now, in my approach into uh, children that have uh, atopic dermatitis, let's say if they are mild 
and uh, they don't see any particular food trigger. The most important thing first is to optimize the skin management. So are they properly moisturized? You know, are they using the proper anti-inflammatory uh, treatment? Are they using antihistamine? So proper skin management first. Then in these patients that really have been discovered to have food triggers, let's say you skin test them, uh, they have a good history of the food allergy trigger. For example, egg, like you mentioned. What I would do is, in my practice, I would then do a food challenge to baked egg rather than the regular egg. So uh, baked egg in a standardized uh, recipe, uh, then they will introduce it in the clinic as an oral food challenge. And I will observe them for uh, two hours after the food challenge. And if there is no problems, then we can introduce the egg in their diet. Now, if they have an eczema flare, because it can happen 24 to 48 hours later, I tell them to come back to the clinic. So what I do is, yes, they might be sensitized to egg, but I'm going to use a less allergenic form of the egg, which is in baked egg. And it founds that the high temperature, the cooking in the different food matrix makes it less allergenic and about 70% of these children can tolerate that egg. So in my practice, I do that. And I found that these children that are able to tolerate the baked egg, they develop tolerance to the egg at a much earlier stage. And the atopic dermatitis do not flare up when you put them on a baked egg diet. And this egg allergy resolves much faster. And if they accidentally ingest egg hidden, like a real actual egg hidden in their food, they do not develop the severe exacerbation that they developed in the past. So there, there is something to it. And I think we're now moving uh, towards food immunotherapy through introduction now, rather to avoid it. So I think I'm moving towards that form of a treatment. Uh, but not using the true food uh, immunotherapy where they use powdered egg. I use a much less allergenic uh, method, and then I follow them with skin prick test, and if the skin prick test gets smaller over time, I challenge them to the real egg. So that's how I approach uh, this uh, clinical scenario that you presented. Mm -hmm. I wonder if my other colleagues have any other opinions as well. Just, just one point before we um, uh, we uh, ask uh, Professor Wang and uh, to you. Um, what we do is, I know baked egg is very good, but what we do is that we give a hard boiled egg. I mean, the eggs are boiled for about twenty minutes, and then if the child is uh, sensitized to even the egg yolk, we start with egg yolk, and we give a graded uh, challenge uh, test. And depending at what stage the child develops uh, reaction, we try to give one level less than that. And we ask uh, the mother to start giving that at home twice a week or thrice a week. And then we gradually grade it up. And, uh, yes. you know, and many of them over a period of uh, two to three years, they grow out of it and uh, they are able to tolerate uh, uh, egg. More difficult with milk, of course, but again, more so with egg but my a little bit of my question was i what i tried to say is that some uh, uh doctors and even sometimes we if this child has very bad eczema uh, and the child is sensitized to egg and has egg allergy um do we ask the mother to avoid because she's breastfeeding the child during uh, the breastfeeding correct. so do we ask the mother to avoid the egg in its full form of course you can have egg in the cake or egg in bread but do we ask them to avoid egg in the full form till the eczema is a little better because the, she's breastfeeding the child yes actually uh, breastfeeding you can introduce the allergenic uh, antigen the food antigen through the breast milk so this is where the history is very important i really really sit down to tease out the information Sometimes it's hard to get from the history because the mother isn't really sure. In this situation, I will ask them to avoid and see what happens. If, uh, if they give a strong history that, yes, every time I breastfeed, I eat the, the egg and then there is eczema flare, I will tell them to stop giving the 
the regular egg in their diet and try the big egg. Uh, it is the least allergenic form. Most of the time it works and they, they have no issues because the breast, the breast milk does uh, carry some of the allergen. But we feel that whatever is expressed in the breast milk is in the least allergenic form that is most likely to be uh, tolerant uh, to, the, to the infant, to the child. So that's what I encourage, unless the, the history is very strong, which you do. I do have uh, patients in which the mother consumes the egg and then uh, breastfeed and then there is eczema flare. It happens. I've seen that. And I agree on that. I, I also agree. Yes. I, I yeah. deeply appreciate. So, uh, so Professor Wang or Professor Ziu, can you please uh, ask any questions you have to Professor Ken? Yeah, uh, I think uh, I uh, agree. I totally agree with uh, Professor uh, Wu said. Um, we have to uh, look out very carefully, particularly on the history. But one thing is very important is that somehow you can see that um, some of the uh, food allergies occur in the very young infant, they will not totally become eczema. Some of the food allergy child, they, they will express on the urticaria and also the skin manifestation like anaphylaxis or angioedema. But still, some of them will have a totally different. Like uh, uh, Professor uh, Lupi Pavanka had mentioned that still some of the child will be, will be very severe eczema and if you look up all uh, or he or she uh, and or her uh, profile uh, allergy profile they will have uh, multiple allergy but i will uh, i will regarding there um, there is uh, a lot of uh, pseudo allergy or just only cross reacted because it was due to the very high ige uh, production so one thing is very important is that how is it possible that if we, uh, because uh, Professor Ken, uh, Ken you have mentioned the relationship between the food allergy and the skin, uh, uh, skin eczema. So one thing is that is it possible that we focus first of all, I uh, improve the skin eczema using the, uh, like uh, uh, Professor Tu uh, uh, Hong said, using ammonia and uh, uh, totally using the skin care. And if we need it, we have to apply for uh, for topical steroid or the other uh, thing. Well, we will recover for the skin condition. Then maybe some of them will have also improved their food allergy situation. Then we can uh, continue for the uh, for for the trying and in, and early introduction. So, I, I my my point is that we have to more proactive to treat the skin allergy and also food allergy as early as possible. And uh, I really think that avoiding is the uh, is really uh, is non uh, non suitable for the present thinking and also that is the uh, old uh, old thinking that usually we 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 have to introduce as early as per, uh, possible uh, for the food allergy and also try to uh, prevent and treat eczema as early as possible to pay, to to restore their skin barrier. Then we, I really think that that will prevent the further sequence after the maybe one year of age, a lot of allergy disorder will happen with decreasing. Uh, yes, uh, I also have a question uh, for uh, Professor Ken Wu. Uh, I think you will uh, agree with me that in some cases of the children who have AD and they are under the exclusive breastfeeding, but when we ask the, the mother to stop using the diary products, the AD get improved. And when the mother uh, eat the diary product again and the AD flare up and the children was not didn't eat anything. So in this case, how can we explain the sensitization to the cow's milk uh, in those cases? Do you have any idea about that? Well, it, it turns out that the uh, cow milk protein uh, can be expressed through the breast milk where through the ingestion from the mother and uh, the maternal intake of the cow milk protein, they take it um, and small amounts go into the breast milk and the child gets sensitized. 
And that's why we see certain children where they were exclusively breastfed. But of course, the mother uh, doesn't have any food avoidance. And we see this in children that is uh, uh, changed to weaning from breastfeeding to cow milk formula. And even on the first ingestion, they can get the non-IgE mediated food allergy, like f pies, for example. Or they can get an IgE-mediated reaction like urticaria, angioedema. Or you can get the mix in between like atopic dermatitis, you know, eczema flare. So we are seeing a huge realm of spectrum from this uh, food allergy presentation in exclusively breastfed children. Now you can say that, look, it can come from the breast milk. It can also come from the skin. So you can get sensitized through the skin and you can get sensitized through the skin, through the environment. So in Malaysia, uh, people eat dairy products all the time in the, in the house, uh, the other family members. And when you gather the, the dust from the house, you can measure food allergens from there. You can measure, you'll see uh, egg allergens, uh, milk allergens and peanut allergens. And uh, I think Jidian Lags group demonstrated nicely. And uh, the, these allergens that are found in the house dust, they are biologically active and they can uh, trigger. So yes, it can come from breast milk, it can come from the skin as well, skin exposure to the dust. So uh, I, I think that uh, that is uh, something very interesting and small amounts. Thankfully, we're not seeing it in all our children. You know, that would be a, a difficult situation. Certain children are very, very allergic and very easily sensitized. Do you think that in the IED patient, they, they not only have the impaired structure of the skin, but they also have the impaired in the gut mucosa uh, cont contaminant? I mean, a different yes. Sense. Yes, absolutely. It's a complex multiplay. Uh, multiple factors, each one interplaying with one another. I think uh, Professor Ju, Ju Yao Wang uh, showed that, you know, the microbial uh, dysbiosis uh, also plays a role. Um, we can see that tape stripping or mechanical skin trauma causes uh, intestinal permeability, increased mast cell production and leaky gut, if you look at it at the lay literature. You can see that inflamed skin causes inflamed mucosa lining, either allergic rhinitis, asthma, and the gut. We used to think of them as individual compartments that function independently. I don't think we can think that way now. They all communicate with one another. You have to look at it as a whole. So you have uh, atopic dermatitis children with food allergy, allergic rhinitis, and asthma. You just can't treat one disease only. You've got to treat them all in order to have a much better outcome. You got to treat the microbiome, the skin, the allergic rhinitis, arrow allergen exposure, immunotherapy for arrow allergen sensitization. Hopefully food immunotherapy will be coming up soon here in Malaysia. So many things. So you just can't, you know, it's a multiple factorial thing. You just can't use one Two, you need multiple tools and multiple approaches. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ken. That was wonderful. And of course, That's we can cool. come back yeah. to you for questions again. Yeah. But um, for now, let me uh, move on to Professor uh, Wang and uh, ask her uh, about uh, this very, very important topic. Number one is that uh, you showed very nicely and we have similar data and also think it's very important of the role of antibiotics actually uh, playing a key role in the in dysbiosis and this leading to um, allergic uh, manifestations including eczema that is one and the other one is also um, the role of probiotics uh, in glad when we actually published we had some data for lactobacillus GG, uh, mm -hmm. being able to prevent um, atopic eczema in a proportion of children. So it was a conditional recommendation to mm -hmm. um, uh, that it could be used in 
mothers and breastfeeding uh, mothers and in infants uh, as a conditional recommendation because of its effect on atopic eczema, but no effect on any of the other allergic diseases. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about you, especially because you have done a lot of studies in this. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be uh, the future role of probiotics? And just if you could touch also a little bit on maybe prebiotics or symbiotics also. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, thank you uh, for Professor Dubi Pavanka. You have mentioned this is a very important issue. And I also uh, like to thank um, uh, Professor uh, Ken Wu, you have mentioned, uh, the, make a comment that now we have regarded allergy disorder. It's not an uh, individual compartment uh, disease. It's actually it's, um, the generalized uh, systemic uh, TH2 uh, uh, bars immune response to the to our environmental stimulation and so it's all spread and also have a common feature and the most important thing is that recently uh, very very we a lot of uh, very good research work and also recent breakthrough and uh, uh, amazing finding is about our uh, commensal commensal microbiota in our organ and how they how they play a very important part to have to mediate our health and also disease. So if we regarding on this part, I will answer two points. One is uh, Professor uh, Luke Pawanka just mentioned that previously our uh, the, the seminar people uh, from the from Nancy using the uh, that of uh, bacillus nominates, it called the LZG. But unfortunately, it just only very have a short effect, in the short term effect in the uh, pre uh, preterm period and also uh, be, uh, about one or two years of age, they have can prevent for allergy disease. But still, we still have a lot of, uh, do not understand, first of the day, what is the dose effect? What is the strength effect, and what is the really what? Uh, how probiotic can have uh, this prevented, and maybe have a have a treatment for the allergy disorder? So I just mentioned that. Uh, <clears throat> the second point is that maybe they will do also need a uh, we we need a, a classification, and also we need a more a uh, research on the probiotic. What is the really uh, what kind of strain? Maybe they have a geological difference. Even I will mention about them maybe have a racial or a geographical difference because we know the microbiota depend on our environment and also our diet. A lot of Asian people we have found that our diet uh, habit is totally different from the uh, Caucasian and the Western Europe. So it also affect our microbiome on uh, the population. So one kind of uh, property strain can really have a re, uh, have a um, have a really uh, most impact to change our uh, our composition. That is the, uh, one of the issue. The other is that we maybe need a prebiotic that will provide like five on fibers or high uh, high fiber dyes and to increase more not just only one strain maybe have a whole population that is per body effect and the third day is that maybe some of the per body effect we were that were not directed due to their uh their interaction uh, with our uh, our immune cell they maybe have a go through the metabolite that is called a postbiotic. So it's a whole range of the new field that we have to understand and how the microbiota have related to our allergy disorder. And this microbiota definitely influenced by our environmental exposure as well as our our nutrition and our uh, our environmental effect. So this is a whole new field. But I really think that if we want to prevent it and really have an intermediate effect. First today, we will have a, a ratio that very simple way, ammonium uh, can have a prevent uh, atopic dermatitis and a food allergy. The, the second thing is maybe we have to focus on the microbiota and maybe for the probiotic. Okay. Thank you very much. So any questions from uh, for Professor Wang from the other panelists? Can I ask the questions? Yes. Uh, your 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 talk was very wonderful, and um, 
actually, um, in atopic dermatitis, we, we know that there is a dysbiosis on the skin also, not only in the gut. And uh, several companies, they, um, they, they provide the moisturizer supplemented mm -hmm. with the probiotics. So yes. what do you think about the role of that kind of moisturizer in, in, in uh, treating atopic dermatitis? Okay, I would think the rationale is good because already they have shown that using the uh, normal, uh, uh, actually they have one of the study, but it's just only very few people. They were taking the skin uh, microbiota from the healthy people and apply in the atopic dermatitis patient. And they found some of the uh, content or property that can have a beneficial effect. But unfortunately, this is not a so-called uh, a placebo control or double blind study. So, so the from the rationale, it, it it should be okay. But still, we need to understand what kind of strain and how the interaction with our skin uh, dysbiosis and what is the uh, uh, metagenomic uh, effect that improve for the atopic dermatitis. So I will just only say it's uh, have a potential and a very good rationale, but still we a lot of commercial products come out, they need a, a clinical trial to prove they really have a uh, fit for their claim that, that can have a uh, uh, really uh, beneficial for the atopic dermatitis. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, I, I do have some questions and uh, comment. I think one of the challenges about the topical probiotics, at least in the uh, ability for widespread use, is the viability. We yeah. used to, we think that the, you know, the probiotic must be alive. Uh, maybe if it's uh, not alive, uh, mm -hmm. then it might not uh, provide uh, the, such a benefit which leads to the excellent study that uh, Professor Wang has did uh, on the portion of the probiotic. So that, that, that study that you showed, how, my question was, how do you decide that, that particular protein? What, what was the thinking behind the rationale and the research behind that you didn't tell us that led you to yeah, look at a particular protein? That really, really, was very mm -hmm. interesting because that can solve a lot of our problems because you have it standardized, right? Mm -hmm. You can right. Uh, use it and you mm -hmm. can make sure that you have an ability to distribute mm -hmm. and test multiple different mm -hmm. uh, uh, scientific uh, research can be done with it. So please share with us your insights okay. and your thoughts on that. <laughs> Oh, okay, I'll just make it short because I just only have a 20 minute of presentation. I just skip about two or three uh, very important study uh, research from our lab. Is that we have uh, applied for this uh, probiotic in our uh, mice model for asthma. And uh, we found some of the strain were have a responsive, the other strain is non-responsive. So we compared it and I find out that it will depend on one of the very important uh, cell receptor we call the PIPA gamma. PIPA gamma is the anti-inflammatory receptor. We found uh, some of the uh, our property have using the probiotic, uh, using the uh, PIPA gamma uh, stimulation and increase their anti-inflammation effect then can, can suppress uh, for the asthma and the allergy disease. So, so we uh, so we got a, a one of the principle is that we have to screen what kind of pep peptide or ca cell component from probiotic can have the end the increase for pipa gamma effect. So we using as a screen a screen platform, and uh, so the the uh, this uh, this bacteria and uh, this probiotic we just break it down and also culture in the supernatant and using a lot of our, uh, biochemical uh, method to um, become a several, uh, uh, more than 100 fraction. And then one of the fraction is very, very strong uh, for the increase for PIPA gamma. And we found that fraction contain the LGB40. So actually that, that protein is a dehydrogenase. Well, I just only can mention that. And so we, we cloned it and uh, make a recombinant protein, and then we found it still have a biological effect. So like you said, we want to uh, uh, go in further. So we, we think this is so-called a postbiotic, not just only using the uh, live strain 
uh, depend on the life, uh, life strain probability. We just don't use their product or even their metabolite then we to treat the asthma or allergy disorder. So that is uh, how, how we get uh, this protein. Very exciting. I can't wait to get uh, more Thank data. You. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions to Professor Wang? If not, I will try to, because of uh, time constraints also, let's move to you. And so um, my first question to you is, I think this is a very, very important uh, topic because from a clinical practice point of view, we use, of course, we use emollients uh, 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 in children who have severe eczema and uh, it's shown to be helpful. But again, like you said, there are many different aspects uh, of it, the, um, the timing of the use, whether it's used immediately, whether it's delayed. And also, we also know that it's very that the skin barrier is very important. This is crucial. This has been touched upon by Professor Kent also, and you also mentioned so the filigrin and is, is crucial. So, uh, when you have uh, patients with um, atopic dermatitis, I mean, what kind of emollients do you advise clinically? And do you regularly advise that, or it's more like from your research interest point of view? Yes, uh, that is very interesting questions. And, uh, and we know that the emollient uh, usually is it's right. It's a basement treatment for 80 patients. So usually on the, the 80 patient, the doctor prescribe the emollient or the, the moisturizer. And however, we first we have to uh, advise the patient to apply the moisturizer only on the dry skin, not in the wet skin. If the lesion is wet, we avoid to, to apply the moisturizer is the first thing. The second thing is that uh, in some cases, if we use a very thick uh, moisturizer, for, for example, the cream, the cream form, not the, uh, the lotion form, the cream is very thick and this can cause an irritation in, for that patient. So we usually advise the patient with a very reddish skin to use the 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 the, um, the lotion form not um, the cream form not very thick form and the third one is the time of applying the moisturizer if we advise the patient to apply the moisturizer within three minutes after passing they they are very stressful they always ask, and, they, and they cannot follow our uh, advice uh, because they don't have enough time within three minutes to apply the moisturizer and it's very stressful for for the parents and uh, when we look at the recommendation from the guideline, we found that there is no evidence to support that recommendation. So whether it is uh, reasonable to uh, advise a patient like that or not. And we did uh, a need, and um, as, I prevent, uh, as I presented to you a study in pediatric patient, they concluded that there was no difference in the moisturizing effect between the immediate and delayed moisturizing. And we repeat again in healthy donor, in healthy volunteers and we found the same findings that was no different uh, effect in uh, between the immediate and delayed moisturizing so i think we should perform more study in 80 patients to uh, to have a better recommendation for the parents and don't make them stressful mm -hmm. i think i would like to just ask from your from a very practical point of view with this covid pandemic that we have I mean, one of the things we face really as a challenge in the clinic is the children, even if they're radius control, but they suddenly have flare up uh, because of this continuous washing of their hands and continuous using of alcohol. I mean, basically true, because it's uh, uh, one of the preparedness that we do for uh, preventing the spread of uh, COVID. So, uh, often children whose uh, eczema is controlled come back with just uh, redness and dry skin and eczema on their hands. Do you come across these? And if so, how do you manage these? Yes, it's very relevant uh, question mm -hmm. at this time in the COVID pandemic. And uh, usually in the children under five years old, we don't advise them to use the, the hand sanitizer. I mean, the quick one they have to use the soap and water to wash their hands. And with the children um, over than five years old, they can use the uh, this, uh, the, the, the hand gels to wash their hands. 
and because dough contains a very high level of alcohol, then it can dry the skin. So we usually advise them to use the gel form because the gel contains the glycerol and it can help a little bit um, moisturize the skin instead of the liquid one that means only water and alcohol. And also, uh, we advise them if they, if they wash their hand by soap and water, they have to apply the moisturizer immediately after washing. Um, and to, to, to uh, shorten the time that the skin is exposed to the air. So it can help to maintain the moisture uh, of the skin. Very much. So any questions from for G from Professor Kent or Professor Wang? I, I have a question and uh, this is, you know, the struggle that we all have now in terms of uh, primary prevention of uh, allergic disease and with atopic dermatitis as the, the first step of the allergic march. And there have been a lot of studies that talked about early moisturizing to prevent atopic dermatitis and the allergic march. Initially, it was very, very promising, and then later studies uh, curbed our enthusiasm. Um, just wanted to have your opinion on what are your thoughts on this and uh, what are your current approach. Let's say in a, in a child with a high risk, uh, we as uh, a history of uh, atopic diseases or older sibling with atopic dermatitis. Do you have any primary prevention strategies for atopic dermatitis other than probiotics, which uh, Professor Wong has uh, nicely shown us, but how about from the moisturizing uh, standpoint? Any, uh, any ideas or any strategies? Yes, yes, thank you for that question. And that question is also my own questions. Actually, uh, previous years ago, I found an article saying that if we apply the moisturizer to the children with the high risk of allergy, if their parent, one of their parents have the atopic dermatitis, and we apply the moisturizer to uh, the children uh, right after birth, it will decrease the half risk, the half in the risk of atopic dermatitis uh, formation. Uh, so I um, wonder, but I cannot find another study to support to that study, the only one study uh, give that um, that uh, conclusion. So, um, and that only one study cannot say much about the initiative uh, prevention for for the AD um, patient. So, I intend to repeat that uh, study in the future, and I hope that we have some data to show you uh, later. Yeah, we can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yes, Professor Wang, do you have any questions? Uh, I just want to follow up uh, the comment from Professor Wu. Yes, I think it's very important. We, we still need a, a, a more uh, like a very concrete or more practical uh, way to prevent the early sensitization and the development for allergy disorder. At the present moment, I will focus on the probiotic. But Still, probiotic is still have a lot of questions there. So we need a uh, need a first cohort a study very early and a follow up all the way until six years of age. I think that if we can have a first cohort study and uh, you can compare all the if they use it in morning or not or is there year and give it a probiotic is any have a very fair then we can answer uh, and get a, a very good local data. But what I am going to uh, emphasize is that, for example, for the ammonia, if the Professor Ruby Bangwanka in the Japan, it's really highly recommended because they have a cold and a dry condition. But in mainland and in Malaysia, or even in Taiwan, we, we have a very humidity uh, situation, uh, the temperature, and so, uh, in my hometown in the Thailand, in the south part of Taiwan, it's very difficult to persuade uh, the parent to use a lot of ammonia, particularly during the hot season. So, uh, and uh, in the hot season, like summer, we have very humidity. And apply the ammonia, they will get uh, very sticky and uh, it, 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 it somewhat is it, very difficult to continue. So I really think that maybe in the, our Southeast Asia, we need a, a different kind of protocol and, and that is suitable for, for our situation. We cannot always follow up the data from the European country or even 
in, in, uh, in the very uh, cold temperature country. We have to uh, find out is any tropical allergy that was very important in our area and we need a certain kind of um, local suitable and a tailor-made uh, prevention protocol for our allergy child. Yeah, I mean, yes, that's I a very important point. And, it, and uh, I, I have to say that, you know, despite uh, Japan being colder, we have colder temperatures, but we have very hot summers. Mm -hmm. And um, we, are, we have almost 90% humidity. Mm -hmm. So it's also a challenge for us uh, in mm -hmm. many ways. And uh, uh, we generally ask the patient the preference that they prefer to have a lotion or a cream, uh, what, what would they prefer? And generally we try to ask them to have it after the bath. Like they have a Ofro uh, bath at night and then we ask them to apply it at night and not so much during the day. But of course, depending on the severity of that, we might have to give it more often. But uh, there is a preference that we give uh, to the patient on the acceptability of what the patient would use. But yes, some months of the year are better, but then we do we do also have quite hot temperatures and 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 very high humidity. It's, it's also an issue here. So yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, but patient acceptability and the other important thing, but which is there for everything, whether it is emollient or any oral medication or inhalers, compliance is always a big problem in. Uh, chronic uh, uh, non-communicable diseases of which allergy is one. I mean, the World Health Organization has said that NCDs, the compliance is just about 50%. So it's uh, so important uh, to actually uh, partner with the patient to make them understand actually the, uh, where, for example, one of the things we often f uh, find is that the, <clears throat> The moment the eczema is off, they will stop the um, applying the uh, treatment. You know, and so we tell them that even if you don't see anything on the skin and the skin is clean, please remember that there is uh, uh, still inflammation uh, underneath the skin. And so, say for example, if you're using it like once a day or uh, twice a day, then you uh, taper it down to once a day, and you continue for two weeks or so. And then, uh, you know, once every alternate day so, uh, to keep the inflammation down. So this, I think, uh, making the patient understand a little bit more about the disease is also patient education is crucial. And I think that's something which we can also work together to try to develop for, for the region. Uh, you know, some kind of ways to reach out to give more knowledge to the patient because uh, we do that at conferences, like we have some patient forums and we do that individually, like make some kind of patient booklets. But it's nice if we as an organization could create something and then uh, have it translated to the different languages, local languages, simple ones that would help create more understanding, uh, not only about the current treatments, but also about the future mm -hmm. potential treatments, especially because like what uh, Professor Wang said about probiotics, and that's what even the GLAD-P recommendation is that it's strain specific. It's very strain specific. So you cannot say all probiotics are effective. Uh, it, it, is, it depends on the strain. So, yeah. So yeah. it was a very excellent, um, I mean, three excellent talks. Yeah and very lively discussion. I wish okay. we could go on and on and on because there is so much we can talk. Uh, I'm looking forward to have all of you again, uh, um, uh, maybe on a different topic or an update of this. But thank you very much, uh, Professor Ken, Professor Wang, and Professor Hu for the lovely, lovely presentation for the time we put uh, to do it for, for Apache, Apache's membership and community and um, uh, also for the excellent way you have presented it and also discussed the matter, which is uh, really, really useful. Thank you and very much. Thank you. thank you for our president, you. Professor Pawanka, organizing this, uh, this seminar. Yeah, thank well, you. It's the teamwork. Thank you. It's the teamwork. Yeah.